All right, my friends, so this is lecture 21, and we're going to look at deep learning today in the context of um, uh, a nice example of supervised learning to uh, distinguish between cell lines that have been stained for actin filament. Um, but before that, I want to give you a few examples of deep learning. We could spend easily a whole day looking at really cool YouTube videos. I want to show a couple at least uh, to motivate some of the major uh, approaches. And then I, I do want to give you a bit of a technical introduction to how deep learning works. And it builds on the, just, uh, the linear regression that we looked at last class. And, and then I'm going to um, shift into um, actually showing you how to do this uh, for the uh, microscopy data that um, comes from a paper in PLOS One from 2019. And uh, I'll finish actually with uh, the, the, some code that's in our studio for you in lecture 21, Deep Learning with Keras. Okay, well, um, the best way to get an idea for deep learning is to look at examples. Um, I'm not gonna show you all these videos uh, here and in the, in the reading list, there's a lot more. Some of them are, not, are required. The ones I think that you should have um, some a little bit more than a superficial understanding about for the course. And then there's a lot that are in the optional section. Learning to, um, let's take a look here at learning to drive. Okay, so this is a, clearly an artificial track, race car track. And right now you see the person who programmed this actually is driving the car. This is not a neural net. This is just the, 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 um, the creator uh, showing the goal here, which is, for cars to learn how to drive themselves around this track. Now, uh, I want to point out here that um, we're not. Th this person hasn't programmed the cars intentionally to drive around the track. All that the programmer done is done is set up neural nets, and the cars, uh, as they proceed, they um, get rewarded for, um, uh, let's say, good behavior. Like a video game, you get points for surviving longer or uh, uh, um, achieving certain tasks, like collecting, you know, diamonds along the path. Here, the car will get uh, the, the car will get rewarded if it say doesn't crash. Okay, so now at the beginning here, the first generation is here. He he starts off with I think it is a he 650 cars, and you can see some of them don't even move. Other ones like go in the wrong direction. Most just kind of hit the wall. Okay. And now, uh, except that one. So he selects that one, and now he basically makes 650 um, uh, versions, random versions of that. So it's the same car, but modified slightly randomly. And with that neural net, then it's sort of propagated, right, into these 650, and it's allowed to evolve in that sense. This is uh, actually combining a neural net with genetic algorithms. And here, now, that, that car that made down there is the one that's chosen for the third generation. And you can see that in each generation, the vast majority of the cars are actually doing even better, right? And you'll see, you'll see some of them car now are starting to actually turn that corner, right? And you can see now that, so, so what the cars do know um, is, is the distance from the wall. All they can measure is the distance from the wall, I believe, right? And their speed. Um, so you see, yeah, like now there are some cars here that are really doing well, right? Like this car, oh, it gets all the way around. And this is just after three generations uh, of the neural net, right? Um, yeah, look at that. See, it really seems to be getting the idea of what it means to not crash, right? And you can see its average speed is increasing, etc. cetera. Um, it's really amazing, actually, in such a short time the neural net, and that's what we're going to look at today, has learned basically a set of weights that succeed. And now I think this is what the next generation? Um, yeah, let's see here. I can't remember. I think this is the last generation, right? But uh, yeah, this, is, this, this isn't very much computation, in fact, at all. But now you can see the vast majority of the mutants from the last round are actually quite able to, to um, drive, right? And yeah, basically um, uh, that's it, right? And with, with no, no, no programming per se, there's never any place in there where he has told the, 
the cars directly what to do, only rewarded them for, let's say, good behavior, right, for not crashing. And it's getting the idea that what's wanted is for it to learn how to avoid those walls, and it's doing an amazing job, right? Like, see, it gets so close there, and it, it must, you know, something, oh, it's crashed. So they're still not perfect, um, but, uh, um, well, okay, so that's one example. Okay, this came out from Google AI in 2018, and it caused quite a stir, and I believe that they shelved the project because it was really disturbing for a lot of people. Uh, I'll just play it for a little while, and um, uh, it's only five minutes long. I'm not sure we'll watch all of it. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. There, uh, a neural net has been used, uh, it, it was used to train, um, sorry, a neural net was trained to uh, learn basic tasks for scheduling uh, individuals, uh, for individuals. So in this case here, uh, it was given examples of, of conversations between people calling for hair appointments or doctor's appointments or the, put the snow tires on the car, which, yeah, it's kind of topical right now. So, uh, and now you can see that um, with, with language um, uh, units, right, in, in the computer, it can simulate human language very well and it can answer and interact with um, uh, a real human, right? So the next example, um, you, this is a classic game of hide and seek. This is just an amazing video. Uh, I'm gonna play it here. Papers with Caro, Jona and Fahir. In this project, OpenAI built a hide and seek game for their AI agents to play. Okay, I'll just uh, look at the exact. Just want to stress here. here that while he's talking, that uh, th there is a there's a physical simulator programmed here, but that's not really what's interesting, right? That that somebody they they've gone in and they programmed. Um, these little creatures and those creatures they all they know is that they can move by sort of shifting left right forward back and They can sense when they bounce into an object uh, But they're not programmed any kind of strategy whatsoever. That's just a neural net. That's learning now what they're showing here If I put the volume back the up moment. These agents learn from previous experiences and to the surprise of no one for the first few million rounds we start out with pandemonium. Okay, so that's really important. You're, they're not showing you millions of rounds of training, but eventually, you know, eventually they do start to figure out how to play the game. Um, and that's, that's the neural net part. Everyone just running around aimlessly. Without proper strategy and semi-random movements, the seekers are favored and hence win the majority of the games. Nothing to see here. Then, over time, the hiders learned to lock out the seekers by blocking the doors off with these boxes and started winning consistently. I think the coolest part about this is that the map was deliberately designed by the OpenAI scientists in a way that the hiders can only succeed through collaboration. They cannot win alone and hence they are forced to learn to work together, which they did quite well. But then something happened. Did you notice this pointy, doorstop-shaped object? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, probably, and not only that, but about 10 million rounds later, the AI also discovered that it can be pushed near a wall and be used as a ramp, and ta-da, got him. The seeker started winning more again. So the ball is now back on the court of the hiders. Can you defend this? If so, how? Well, these resourceful little critters learned that since there is a little time at the start of the game when the seekers are frozen, apparently during this time they cannot see them, so why not just sneak out, steal the ramp, and lock it away from them? Absolutely incredible. Look at those happy eyes as they are carrying that ramp. And you think it all ends here? No, 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 not even close. It gets weirder, much weirder. When playing a different map, a seeker has noticed that it can use a ramp to climb on the top of a box, and this happens. 
Do you think couch surfing is cool? Give me a break. This is box surfing. And the scientists were quite surprised by this move as this was one of the first cases where the seeker AI seems to have broken the game. What happens here is that the Okay, well, it goes on for a little bit with even you know, super cool things, but you get the idea that uh, it, that's actually surprising behavior that uh, they didn't even understand how they you know, could um, sort of break the system, right? That, you know, uh, I, I guess it shouldn't really be the case that if you're walking on the block, the block should go with you, but it's still pretty cool. Yeah, okay. So today, actually, we're gonna look at convolution neural networks, as, which is one type of a deep learning framework. There's a lot of high quality material out there. I, I would really recommend this, uh, oops, sorry, recommend, um, uh, recommend um, Fast AI. That's a course offered from uh, UCSF. And uh, it doesn't require sophisticated mathematics nor computing power. So you can get right into it. Jeremy is an excellent, excellent lecturer and all the, everything from the course is online like this course, you can just download it and um, start right into it. And it's in Python, so they're using Jupyter, which are like our, our, our notebooks, and Pythons are our, and they used to be called PyTorch. And today, at the end, we're gonna see a little bit of Keras. Uh, an important concept is transfer learning that we're gonna talk about a little bit today, so you can see in there. And uh, if you wanna look at, for example, what data wrangling looks like in, in um, uh, fast AI, that's a nice part there. Uh, and uh, some concepts like supervised learning are, are expressed really well in lecture two. And if you're interested, and I think we might come back to this a bit more at the, at the final lecture of the course, uh, there's a nice um, one or two hour uh, lecture on ethics and deep learning. And I think probably already after watching these videos uh, as part of the required reading, uh, you probably get a sense of just where this is going and why ethics would creep in so so strongly. Uh, and of course there's other um, great, great YouTube resources. I, I like this one, it's not too bad, that explains CNNs. So if today's, um, my description is not too good, then go see an expert like there and uh, they'll help, I'm sure. Um, yeah, transfer learning, uh, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. I have this one, I think it's nice, it's kind of a funny video. Well, finding gold, uh, it's in the re reading too. I won't play all of it here, but it's kind of an interesting way. So it, it, it's a good video that explains the concept of transfer learning. Um, I, I won't play it here, but the idea of transfer learning is that you have a classifier that's learned for some problem that maybe is, there's been a lot of data for, okay? And, and then you take that, and, but it's not for your intended purpose, like to locate gold. Maybe it was trained to locate silver or silicon or something else. So, um, you know, closer to, uh, there, are, there are some nice um, examples that are closer to what we want to talk about today with microscopy um, supervised. This is pretty interesting. Okay, so you can see on this side here, it's, it's actually the same place physically. But this one, I, I believe it was filmed in the winter and they're gonna turn this into a summer view. I mean, these are, it's, you know, you understand that they haven't driven down this road twice at different seasons. They drove it down it in this season, and then they computationally made it look like summer. So it's, it's, it's well, I think pretty amazing um, that they uh, can, basically, it's, it's a form of transfer learning in the sense that you take, um, uh, what, what you've trained is a neural net that has a concept of summer of what things should, which objects look like, and they apply that as sort of a filter on top of the actual image, and that you know cre recreates a different um, perspective of the same scene. And there's some really beautiful um, examples of that with art, for example, taking one person's art, and, like Van Gogh, and turning it into somebody else's art. Okay, and um, and then it gets into interesting social issues again. For example, this is a Vice article about. Um, uh, um, a, a topic that's probably going to come up, it become more and more in, in, in important in the coming years, which is basically that uh, pornography, for example, uh, or with with individuals, politicians, um, uh, all sorts of you know people of, of importance in the world, 
and superimposing their, their faces onto other bodies relatively seamlessly so that you can't even tell. In fact, it, it, it become, they become so good that um, uh, it's impossible to uh, even computationally determine what's real and what's fake. And so those so-called deep fakes are becoming more and more um, uh, problematic out there. And, and, that's, and, and those videos um, are done using Keras or TensorFlow, and we'll, and we'll see Keras today. It's the same basic software package in R. Uh, and I mean, you can find yourself, if you're interested, uh, some examples of these deep fakes, and um, uh, they're pretty interesting, right? And now you can, I don't think I have a link here, maybe in the required reading, uh, showing how people can make somebody say anything they want. Like, oh, there's, I think, a pretty classic one of Obama giving a speech that he never gave. But it's, it's these neural nets that are um, interpolating how, uh, how Obama would, you know, how his face would look as he says each word, how he would hold his body, how he would express things, how he, where he would put his emphasis on words. All of these things can, um, are being uh, um, modeled there. This is pretty funny. I, you know, it doesn't take too long to play this one. Uh, let's see if I can get it to work here. Yeah, so basically, of course, let's see. Yeah, so what's going on here is that there's a deep learner that's been built to, that controls the camera, and the camera's supposed to track the ball, right? So it starts off, it's being reset and it's tracking the ball, and then it keeps coming back to his head because he's bald, so it keeps confusing the ball his bald head for the ball, right? So all through the game, they're, they're forcing the camera to go back to it, and then it just keeps coming back over here. So yeah, there's still a few problems with these systems, but um, well, yeah, so it's not perfect. There are some nice examples in biology that we won't go into today, but I, I've given the link here to some microscopy, a nice talk from, I think, uh, somebody at the EMBL. Radiology is certainly a big uh, issue these days um, because it's used in disease and um, you know these deep learners can go in and dissect those images that are very high resolution with amazing um, accuracy. Uh, I think that these days a lot of surgery, well maybe not a lot, I'm not sure, but some surgeries at least at research hospitals now is controlled or assisted with AI. This was an interesting paper that came out this year, I think back in January by McKinney et al. It was a Google paper, and they um, built an AI system, a deep learner for breast cancer screening, so mammography, et cetera, and um, it was in nature. And um, well, some scientists really didn't uh, react well to that paper, and in October there was a rebuttal uh, from a number of people, a couple of which I know, Benjamin Hibken at the Princess Margaret in Toronto, uh, Michael Hoffman in Toronto, um, and uh, well, I, basically, uh, well, the, the paper itself was was claiming that you know it could identify early tumors, very small tumors, in, from these images uh, extremely well, better than humans can do it, uh, and well, which may or may not be true. I, I think the um, the backlash or the, the controversy surrounding it. Um, that's pointed out by um, Heib Kame all is that uh, they don't really make their algorithm uh, available, and neither, nor the training data set, I believe. And so that's an issue then about uh, reproducibility. How is the community supposed to reproduce uh, and evaluate that algorithm if they can't, if they don't have access to it, and if they don't have the data that was used to train it? So how do we know it's right? I mean, as you guys know already, it's very easy to make mistakes in code. Uh, no matter how advanced you are, you can still make mistakes. So, you know, how do we know that there's not bugs in those systems? And, uh, you know, how can, you know, we have to be sure that we can reproduce science. And that's not possible if it's behind a cloak of um, industrial application, et cetera. Or it's an, it's an interesting issue. Now, there is other opinions. I know there's somebody from Australia was quite outspoken saying that they didn't think that was really much of a problem um, with, and they had some pretty strong or interesting arguments in that direction too so 
it's certainly a debate out there, but uh, we know we have to be able to uh, maintain um, quality and standards, right? We have to be able to evaluate, evaluate each other's work. And uh, when when Google, for example, uh, uses perhaps tens of thousands of CPUs or GPUs or TPUs, whatever they're using, uh, with massive computers basically to compute these deep learners, how can we ever repeat that, right? We, we can't because Google's advantage really is that they're one of the few, if not the only um, entity out there that can assemble all of those, uh, all that computational power. So, well, we would have to be careful as we move that towards the clinic to make sure that it, it is actually um, performing as they claim. Okay. And uh, I'll leave it here, but the, you know, I would recommend AlphaGo, the movie. It's on Netflix, I believe. And Do You Trust This Computer? It's also on Netflix. Both of those are pretty good movies, very different for, um, for seeing where some of this deep learning is going. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to some uh, hand notes to look at the um, uh, particulars of, um, of deep learning. All right, so today we're going to look at um, uh, some, some uh, microscopy images and try to classify them. So it's an example of supervised learning. In particular, this is coming from a paper by YL in class one last year. You can access it here. And our input is a bunch of high-resolution actin-labeled fluorescent microscopy images from three different breast cancer um, cell lines. Well, MCF10A actually is actually a surrogate for normal mammary epithelial cell lines, around 200 example images of those. On uh, MCF7 uh, breast cancer epithelial cell line, this is a, um, generally considered to be a model of the luminal ER positive uh, breast cancers and MDA, uh, MDA, MD231, or something just called 231 cells. They're also breast cancer, but it's a more of a clod and low uh, basal um, type cell line. And um, generally speaking, as we know from a lot of discussions in the course, the basal triple negative uh, breast cancers are more aggressive than the MCF7. Okay, so our goal is to classify each image as belonging to MCF10, 7, or 231. Okay, so this is multi-class classification. All right, so it's, uh, it's classification because it's not a continuous value, we're just trying to classify them as groups one, two, or three, right, each image. And there's some examples here. This is an MCF10 uh, cell, this is an MCF7 cell, and several, well actually there's several, I believe three MCF7 cells there and several um, two, three, one cells here. So it, actually in each image, it's not one cell necessarily. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And, and basically what we want to ask is, can we look at these cells and know whether, if they were unlabeled, right? That's what we want to guess is whether um, we could classify them by features in the image as one of these three, these three cell lines. So you could ask why, and I think that you know, it's not that way. It's, it, clinically, we're going to have a situation where we don't know what cell, what cells, you know, are originate from what cell line. That's not really a clinical application. But what we're trying to use is the classifier to identify properties in these images that might be uh, predictive or, or uh, differences between these three different uh, states: normal, sort of indolent or lower, less aggressive tumors, and higher aggressive tumors. So. Basically, in the end, what we're saying is, is there differences in the actin structure that we can find that correlate with the aggressiveness of breast cancer? So there might be some kind of utility for that. And then we could look at those features and see what that you know, means in terms of the underlying biology. Well, one class, and you should try it yourself, you'll have access to the data in our studio cloud. It's there now in the data directory, is go look at a few images and ask yourself if you can tell the difference by eye between these three um, these three classes. And here you see a what's called a confusion matrix because we have the 10, the 7, and the 231 on the columns, and the 10, the 7, and the 20, uh, 231 on the rows. So the diagonal means that the, the human guess matched the true class, and, and it's not that great, right? Basically here, 
basically here, it's only two thirds of the time, uh, three, three quarters of the time correct um, from the human eye on the uh, 10 and the two, three ones. Although MCF7 somehow is easier to get. But you should try yourself and see how good you are. But there's a lot of confusion, it seems, between um, the ten, uh, MCF10 and 231 cells. And that's, you, you can calculate the accuracy from that. So already, like, the humans don't do that well. And in fact, when we look at radiology and pathology, it's also the case that there's a lot of disagreement between experts uh, on the same samples. So you haven't seen this here. That's a slightly different issue, but if you ask two pathologists to, to rate, to measure similar questions of um, pathologic slides, they'll, they'll also have quite a surprising amount of disagreement. So uh, humans aren't perfect to begin with. Okay, so um, we're gonna use a convolution neural net. That's a type of neural net for this. Uh, and it's gonna have many layers of artificial neurons. Uh, it's gonna look something like this, and it's a schema. But the idea here is that the image is up on, on, at the start. That's what's fed into the system. And it goes through successive layers. You think of it as like the, each of these sheets here um, is basically a, a layer of neurons. I think we can safely call them neurons, artificial neurons. And um, they, uh, they get passed down and, and the message is sort of being uh, um, compressed in a way uh, through successive layers. And ultimately, at the end of this, these, these, uh, this series of artificial neural neurons being pooled, they get pooled, and um, a, a prediction is made through a, a, a something called a soft max. And this is going to output either 10 for MCF10, 7, or 2, 3, 1. So 1, 2, or 3, this is what it decides. So all of this information gets kind of channeled, channeled down, compressed, 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 until it makes a call as to what cell line it believes it belongs to. But, and, and this is not very hard to implement in the uh, Keras package in R, and there's code on RStudio uh, Project 21 to do that. But let's take a look at some of the theory behind it because I think you guys are ready for that now. So uh, let's, let's back up to last class when we talked about linear regression in L20. Okay, so for, for one attribute, we know that we would have a model that looks like this where why our output in this case here uh, in, in the previous example I'm sorry this was like death days two the time to um, an event is modeled as um, the intercept plus the slope times an attribute x plus some noise right and this was the case when d is equal to one and basically then uh, if you have a lot of such examples say n of them you build, uh, you, you have this series of, of equations. And for two attributes that we saw last class, nothing really changes. It's just that now that we have this theta one times x one plus theta two times x two. And for d attributes, we'd have d such terms. Now, now what is kind of important from the um, neural net perspective is, is, is this view here. And it deserves some comment. So basically, the intercept for us in the neural net world is not important at all. We don't really care about it. And so we can think of it as being sort of like a zero or a one coming in, but it's just basically a line coming in. The rest of the nodes are represented like here, x1, x2, all the way up to our d variables. So, so basically each of these variables are um, nodes, right? And our output, our, our um, response variable y is a node and it's, it's the child, right, of all of these guys. And, and these thetas are, are basically associated with the arcs. Again, they're kind of like weights, right? So basically, uh, we could think of theta zero being one, but all the rest of these guys as being the, sort of the, uh, the amount that we, we, mo we modify x1. So if theta one is a half, then the x in x1 is a five, then 2.5 um, goes into y, right? Okay. So that's, that's the typical way that we view uh, in the deep learning world. And that's part of what's called a perceptron. The total definition of a perceptron is not too far removed from that. We can think of it as an artificial neuron. It's very artificial. It's just a high, you know, a very abstract view of it. So we have our uh, linear regression here, which we're all very comfortable with, that part. But there's one extra node called y bar 
from y, okay? And the value from y is passed through what's called a ReLU function, okay? And sometimes a ReLU function is represented graphically like this. And well, the ReLU function is kind of simple, but it's really kind of weird, but actually it has a lot of power. It's, but it's very simple. So if y, sorry, if y here is less than zero, then y bar is zero. So if, if y is minus five, y bar will become zero. If y, this y is greater than zero, y bar is just y. So if, if, if y is a seven, then y bar is a seven. So it essentially, well, it, it, it exactly just makes all negative values equal to zero. Okay, so it's very, very simple. And that's, that is the fundamental unit of a neural network. Now, there are different functions here besides ReLU, but that's good enough for our purposes today. Um, and and uh, but, so it, it's interesting because it's basically just a linear regression, but the output of the linear regression is, turned, it is modulated and there's a discontinuity. So essentially, you know, it's zero for all negative values of Y and it's just Y if it's positive, okay? And that's why they have this diagram here because if Y is down here negative, it just becomes zero. And if Y is positive, it's just Y, right? That's, what, that's why the little graphic. And I, I guess like the, the idea here is that, you, you know, you have um, uh, you know, a, real, uh, a real neuron, right? Has uh, all sorts of inputs to it. Um, uh, so all the dendrites coming as your input, right? And the, 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 um, the, the, the neuron doesn't fire unless there's enough input. So, so basically, if the, if the inputs coming in are below some threshold, it just doesn't fire. And that's sort of like y below zero. But as, long, as, soon, as, that, as soon as you get more uh, than, than enough um, input, it fires. And then it fires sort of as strong as the inputs. So there's a threshold. And that's what that ReLU function does, is turns that re uh, linear regression into a, a threshold. Well, then a neural net is really just a combination of these perceptrons. So here we have Y1 and Y2, and they're both uh, individual perceptrons. This one is in green, and this one is in orange. And, and the inputs to both are the same, right? Um, the X, these ones, X1, X2, up to XD, they're feeding into both the Y1 and to the Y2 perceptron. So this is our, what's, what, this is our top layer, our input layer. And, and this is basically going to be um, a representation of our figure, of our image of the cell. And that's going to be fed into diff in a whole bunch of different perceptrons, not just two, but potentially thousands of them. Okay, and then um, what does change, though, is that the theta 1, theta 2 green are not necessarily equal to theta 1, theta 2 orange, right? So these, 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 um, these thetas, green or orange, um, they can change... Uh, independent of each other, right? So, you know, just like before we saw last class that we set theta zero and theta one, theta two to be the optimal that, you know, the least squares error that minimize the least squares error. Uh, the, the minimum over here in this perceptron may not be the same as over here in this perceptron. And so each of them, each percep perceptron in the model has these thetas that evolve independently. And you can see here that they go through uh, their ReLU gates. And then in, in turn, the output from these guys might get put into other um, perceptrons, right? So here Z is another uh, perceptron. And in fact, uh, these days, the, the, they, they, these might be very deep. There might be 20 or 40, 100, even 200 layers in these neural nets. And that's why to skip ahead here to foreshadow is, is why you need these huge computing farms that Google and Amazon and um, other companies like that have to be able to compute um, these, these giant, giant networks. And eventually what we end up doing is uh, putting the output from Z through another kind of function called a softmax. And usually we represent this uh, function like this. I'll describe it in a little bit. But that, that Z bar has, in our case, only three possible values. 
MCF 10, 7, or 231. Okay, so uh, the softmax converts the real numbers that Z into um, values 1, 2, or 3 into this categorical variable. So a little bit more about that in a second. So yeah, what that could look, it could look very complicated. Um, you would start off as your input layer here, and maybe you, know, you, you have K uh, perceptrons at the first layer that feed into another layer, Z. Uh, so the output of all these perceptrons is then put as input into all the perceptrons at the next layer. So this is something that's called complete linkage. And that's, it's called complete linkage because the, out, uh, the output from each perceptron is, becomes the input for each perceptron on the next level. And then the Zs are put through maybe a ReLU function uh, here, okay? And then the output from all those ReLU functions might be put into another layer of uh, perceptrons, which are then passed through another layer of ReLU functions. And then basically they're uh, a coalesced in essence in this variable Q by a, as a perceptron. And that Q is put through a soft max and we get, you know, Q squiggle. That's our output for whatever categories we're interested in. And again, these perceptrons these days can be really, really deep. And the, the, the thing is, it takes a lot of computational power to, um, to deal with them. So uh, in summary here, so far, what we have is um, linear regression, which you guys are like totally experts on now. The ReLU functions, which are really simple, if it's below zero, it becomes zero. If it's above zero, it just stays what it was. And the softmax function, which turns real numbers into um, uh, to one, two, or three in our case. Um, we'll come back to that. So yeah, we can have densely connected layers. We talked a little bit about already. And we have our input layer up here. And we have our output layer down there. And what we call these inside guys is the hidden layer, OK, or latent. So we don't, these guys here, we don't actually set their values. All we do is we set these values up here. And for us, that's going to be the image that we pass to it. All of these values in here, and you should stop the video now and ask, what values are there there? So if I go back to here, into that figure, what values do I know? I only parameterize, I only have values for x1 through xd. I don't have any of the thetas along here, right? So there's going to be basically k thetas for x1, k thetas for x2. So in total, there's going to be d times k thetas at this level. And then each of these guys feeds into the zeds. So there's k times l thetas at this level, et cetera, et cetera. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pa um, parameters in this model that we don't know. And that's the computational challenge is to search this huge space uh, efficiently. But for now, just think of these guys as the hidden layers. But it's the weighting, right? It's those thetas that encode the neural net, essentially. OK. Um, in reality, you know, if you're really going to get into deep learning, there are more features that you could use, like uh, max pooling and filters of different sorts along this path. But it's not too much more complicated than what you've seen here. And um, well, the rest of it is pretty easy to understand, but uh, we don't need to look at that now. So you can ask yourself why the tapered shape, right? So why is this um, you know, going down towards this? Because uh, down here at the end, this is just uh, basically three values, one, two, or three, right? And you can do that with two bits of information. The input, though, well, that's basically how many pixels you have, right? So if, if your images are, let's say, uh, um, 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, then you're looking at 1 million pixels in two dimensions is what's being pushed into these, into the input of this neural net. And successively through this, these, these neurons, these perceptrons, it's being winnowed down or, or compressed uh, to just be an answer of one, two, or three. So if you wanted to, and some, you could view this as an information theory problem or a, a compression problem of taking very large objects and reducing all of that information into just the numbers one, two, or three. A little bit of computer science theory there for you. 
Well, we usually, in deep learning, we use this term called a tensor, um, which is a fancy word for basically a high dimensional matrix. So we know in R that we have the vector, and we know that we have uh, what a matrix is, it's two dimensional, right? Well, in R, you would call anything above two dimensions, like here, this is 3D, that's a, that's a three tensor, okay? And uh, you could have a four dimensional tensor, a five dimensional tensor. So basically, this is a, a vector is a one dimensional tensor, a, a, a matrix is a two dimensional tensor, three dimensional, et cetera. So um, now you can imagine, for example, here, this is 2D, right? It looks like 2D, except it's actually 3D because each pixel has a value between 0 and 255. Uh, there's only a green channel here. So each value, um, uh, it, it basically, each pixel, so in this image, if it's 800 by 800, in a, if this is 800 by 800 here, you see those values there, then each, um, each pixel, that's one little dot in this image, uh, normally would have three values, one for the red, green, and blue uh, channel. In fact, here we only have a green channel, but each value there is um, a value between 0 and 255. So this is a 2D image, but actually it's three-dimensional three three because there's uh, one red, green, blue in this dimension, the Z dimension here, right? Like that's drawn this way, okay? And so we can represent by that by a three-dimensional tensor. Uh, easily enough. Um, it's a lot, right? I mean, 800 by 800 by three integers is basically almost two million integers per picture, right? That's um, not super small, right? Um, if you are talking about thousands of pictures, but it's, it's manageable. Um, okay, so that's how, that's how we encode our pictures. So now what you could think when you submit to this image to, um, to uh, our, our net, recall that this is our layer up here. Well, we can submit it this, you know, it's, 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 it's the, this layer here receives that image, right, in two dimensions. In our model up here, we had a one dimensional input layer, right, the same thing up here. You could just, like these guys up here, our input variables, this D is going to be 800 by 800 by 3, so 1.92, right? There's going to be 1.92 million variables X in this input layer, and each, each of those X is going to take one pixel from this image, right? So this would be X1, and this would be down here XD, right? And we would just walk through this matrix left to right, and, and, and feed that to the neural net, okay? Hopefully that's understandable. So now what we need to do is, uh, well, you know, follow good uh, machine learning practice and split into a, a training and testing. Now this has been seen before by you guys. Sorry, I needed a small drink. Okay. Um, Let's use 80%, 20% here. It's a debatable value, but that's good enough. And so what we do is just randomly split all of our examples. So if you recall, I think there was something like 182 um, examples for uh, MCF10, I told you at the beginning. And you, you, you know, there's going to be, I think, something like 630 examples for, uh, well, I'm not sure actually. No, that was total. There's 630 examples. So the last one is the 231. And I'll just basically select 80% randomly to be my training set. And the remainder, the remaining 20% all be will be my test set. Okay, so red and green means the random assignment of training and testing. And now, um, now we get into some specific language for uh, deep learning, which is the concept of a mini batch. And we can make a, a fixed size. We'll, we'll say eight. It can be something that that's a it's a, what's called a meta parameter, and we, a meta parameters are parameters for the system. 
So here uh, we could say like 20% and 80% is a meta parameter too. We could have used other parameters, um, a different ratio of training to testing, but we'll start with that. And eight will be our starting size for the mini batch. So what all, all the mini batch is, is that we split, we split our examples, our 80% of 630 was 504 examples. So that approximately 500 examples are split into batches of 63. So 504 divided by eight should be around 63 mini batches. So it's just a random assignment. And basically a mini batch is like a bite, bite size. So we're gonna send these guys all at once to the training. And when the, when, when the neural net's kind of eaten them all, we're gonna set, send the next batch, right? So you can think of it as like the mini batches being one spoonful of the, of the you know, food. And so here's the algorithm, the pseudocode for it, is that we, 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 um, we go from one, let I go from one to the number of epochs. Epochs is another interesting uh, deep learning um, jargon. It, it's, think of an epoch as just being one round of training. Uh, normally, you don't just do one round. It, it, every time you go through all of your 63 mini batch, batches, that's one epoch, okay? So basically, we would split our, our data into mini batches, and, that, and then we would go through it feeding those eight, or what is it, 63 spoonfuls to the, the deep learner monster, and that would be the end of epoch one. Then we would go back and we would create a new mini batch, maybe a new random assignment, and we would feed um, the next mini, those mini batches in order back to the, to the monster. Okay, so for each, within each buck, we decide a priori how many we want to do, like maybe 10. And then for each mini batch from one to 63, okay, then for each training sample, so how many training samples do we have? Around 504, oh, sorry, for each training sample in that mini batch, right? So let's suppose we fed it mini batch one. The first guy would be this MCF7 image. What do we do? Well, we have to do something called propagate that sample forward in the neural net. I'm going to show you what that is in a second. So basically what that's going to mean intuitively is that we feed it to the neural net. And then what we're going to do or what the neural net does is it calculates something called the loss for the uh, mini batch. Okay. All right. So you feed it all the examples into the network. You push them through from that mini batch and then you calculate basically how good the model is for that mini batch. And then you use that measure of how good it is to then adjust the network parameters. And that's called the backwards phase. And that's what updates these thetas, okay? That's what our, you know, it's the thetas, right? If you stopped the lecture like last time when I suggested, that's, it's the edges, right? Those arcs, it's those parameters, theta one through theta d, et cetera all through the network that we have to find the proper values for. And so now basically what we're doing in the backwards phase is, is saying, okay, well, I added these examples to the neural net. This is how good the neural net is doing so far. And that suggests how we could improve the model. So in the backwards phase, we update the thetas to do better. And we just keep repeating this until we've gone through all of the uh, mini batches, right? And then we, com we compute the performance, let's say the accuracy on the test set. That's the data that we left out. So it's the, it's the other 130 or so examples that we didn't use during the training because that's an independent um, set to test on. Okay, so these networks can be very large, but let's just look at a really simple example using one perceptron uh, and a uh, input that's simplified from our problem here. I took, I adapted this from a, somebody on a, uh, Twitter, I am Trask. So here uh, we only have four examples in our learning set, so n is equal to four. And our picture is very simple, just consisting of three bits, uh, zero, zero, and one for the first example, um, et cetera, for the second and third and fourth. And the first two are, let's say, examples of MCF 10, 10 cells and the second are MCF7, so it's a binary classer, classifier instead of a ternary classifier. 
Um, so if we can understand, if you could understand how a single perceptron treats the problem, then I think you get a better intuition of how a massive perceptron that involves tens of thousands of nodes um, works. Okay, so let's look at a one layer neural net as follows. Our variable here is Z, uh, and it takes as input three variables, X1, X2, and X3. And the only three unknowns we have are theta one, theta two, and theta three. This kind of, the idea that, you know, the weights on the arcs coming into Z. And okay, so we're, instead of using the ReLU function, I'll use a, a slightly different one called the sigmoid function. As I mentioned earlier, there's multiple ways of doing this, but here the sigmoid functions are really kind of uh, kind of a cool function. It, it, it basically, Z could be a value that's anywhere between negative infinity and positive infinity, right? So anywhere along the x-axis. What the sigmoid function does is map it to a value between 0 and 1, which is really convenient because when we want to interpret these things as probabilities, of course, we need the value to be zero, between 0 and 1. So here, um, whatever z is, it could be minus 1 billion, it's good, then the sigmoid function will convert that to be basically zero. And if z is positive one billion, the sigmoid function will convert that to be just one. It will converge on one. The uncertainty lies in the middle here. When z is close to zero, then z bar, the, the output of the z, the sigmoid function, that's going to be around a half. Okay, so that's what's written down here. Big Z, one, small Z, zero, and if it's close to zero, it's a half. Okay, so that's a little bit different than the ReLU function, but that's okay. Uh, we'll just go with that one. All right, so now, uh, <clears throat> to start the algorithm that's used in any deep learning approach, we can just basically initialize our three unknowns to be at random numbers. Let's say, um, 0.39, 0.61, and 0.23 for theta 1, 2, and 3, respectively. It doesn't matter what those values are. It's good enough. Okay, so, um, and, and let's make it simple here that there's just one mini batch. So we have our four examples, and that's, so each epic will be trained with one mini batch, and that mini batch will be all of the examples. Okay, all right, so now we have to compute Z for each of the, um, the rows of our design matrix. So the first one will be 0, 0, 1. So 0, 0, 1 here, you see that. And so it's going to be 0 times theta 1, 0.39, which is 0. It's going to be 0 here. And it's just the 1 times 2.3. So it's going to be equal to 2.3. And I can resolve 0, 1, 1, our second example. It'll be 0.84. And the third example, which is 101, 0.63. And the fourth example will be 111, 123. So I, I would stop the video right now and just check my arithmetic that this is correct, right? So th this is the four values of Z for the four examples we see to train on. <clears throat> so now we need to convert these numbers, which could be between negative and positive infinity, arbitrarily big or small, into a number between 0 and 1, because we want these to be kind of like probabilities. So we can use the sigmoid function for that, and that sigmoid function looks kind of scary, but basically when I, I insert this these z values in, I'm going to get back something like 0 0.58, 0 0.7, 0 0.65, and 0.77 for each of those examples. <clears throat> okay, so if I, in the next slide here, um, okay, actually here. So in a way, we kind of want to argue that like it's a 58% chance that this is a 1, which is not good, right? Because if, if we scroll all the way back to our input, we see that the first two examples are zeros, right? So we hope that these guys are zeros and these guys are 1. That's the answer, right? So 001 is an MCF7, not an MCF10, or sorry, it's an MCF10 cell, for example, and not an MCF7, right? It's a zero. And these are the MCF7 cells. So right now, that's not good news because it's saying with 58% chance, 
it's being labeled as a, you know, a one. And same thing for the second example, it's also a zero, right? But um, <clears throat> it's saying it's a 70% chance it's a one. Now the latter two, especially this guy's, the fourth, is 0.77, so that should be a one. But you know, there's no reason for this to make any sense because recall that we chose our Z values entirely randomly. This is the starting point, right? So we have a long way to go. But what we want to do is guide the algorithm by updating the theta parameters in the right direction. So the way that we do that is we calculate our loss function. And that's a really simple thing. It's just basically our observed values y minus basically our guesses right now, the z bars, right? So that the, 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 the output of our network, the z bars, are the, you know, the result of the sigmoid function, right? Between 0 and 1. So the reason why, you know, the other thing is that our y values are between 0 and 1, right? Or they are 0 or 1. Our z bars are continuous values between 0 and 1. So when we calculate that loss, <coughs> excuse me, we see that we're negative 0.5 off from being correct on the first um, uh, uh, example because it's a zero. And for example, we're 0.23 off on the fourth example, which should be a one. Um, so we still have some ways to go. So how do we then adjust our thetas to make a bit of progress? <coughs> so the first thing to observe is that if our, if our Z bars were perfect, in this equation, and they, 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 then they would match the observed values, 0, 0, 1, and so L would be 0, right? So we want to minimize our L, right? We want to min minimize the lost. So then how do we update theta 1, 2, and 3 to get us closer to 0 loss? And that's the back propagation algorithm in deep learning. And a full exposition of that is beyond the scope of this course. but. Suffice it to say is that it involves like basically high school calculus and um, a bit of algorithmics. It's not particularly difficult, but um, it would, it's, it's, it's still a bit of a challenge to kind of to express in um, a short amount of time. <clears throat> but the intuition is pretty straightforward, and that's what I'll give you here. So um, basically, because the sigma function gives us, it gives us some kind of indication of how confident we are in the prediction. So if we have a value for the, the z that's very high, then we're really confident it's one. And if we have a z value that's really low, we're really confident it's a zero. It's, it's when it's close to zero, uh, the z value is close to zero, that we're uncertain. That means it's 50, 50, 0.5. And our examples here right now of z um, were actually, uh, whoops, yeah, so I, I think you should ignore this. Um, I'm going to mark this out. I forgot to update this part here. I'm going to ask you just to ignore the, my, my stupid mistake here, okay? It's on the next slide. So I, I've just reiterated here my Z, my Z bar, and my loss, okay? So the intuition of the next step is to update our, our, our data values by a weighted loss. And we're going to weight the loss by our confidence in the prediction. So that's a bit of a mouthful. So let's go through this slowly. Um, here's my sigmoid. And uh, my values for z are written up here. So 0 0.23, 0 0.84, that's the red square. And um, the infinity sign is 0 0.65, uh, it's 0 0.63. And the black triangle is 1.23. So if I project that onto the y-axis there, that gives me my z my z bar scores, and they're basically here 0 0.58, 0 0.7, 0 0.65, and 0.77. So these guys here, right? And you can see that, for example, uh, yeah, right. So that's my z bar, and my loss here is point is as before, 0.58. Point, uh, minus 0.7, etc. Okay, so <clears throat> what I wanted to point out here is that we can take this, we can take the derivative of the sigmoid function to get the slope, right? And it's pretty not very difficult exercise to take the derivative of the sigmoid function, but um, I've calculated it here for you. And 
you can see that the closer I get to 1, like this guy here, 0 0.77, the lower my slope, right? Which makes sense because it, 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 it bottoms out at 1, right? The steepest point here is the one that's closest to 0. Uh, well, on this axis, 0 0.58, that's 0 0.23. It's this point here. Now we're in a very steep region, uh, and it's 0.25, right? So we're, we're less certain. Okay, so the next step, you, you should uh, probably stop the video and think about it for a little bit. What we need to do is, is multiply the loss uh, by the slope. And so here, my loss is written like this, multiplied by the slope here. And I get something like uh, minus 0 0.145, etc. And But the main thing here is that the first two entries are negative, and these two entries are positive. So <coughs> why do we multiply by the slope? I mean, the essential idea is that the slope tells us which way to update theta, right? So if, if we're supposed to be going towards zero and our value for theta is positive, then we have to make theta smaller. And so we're going to go in the... Uh, <coughs> towards zero, right, in a negative direction. And recall that the first two entries of our, our y vector up here, right, the answer, <coughs> I'm sorry, here, these, these guys here, the first two entries are zero and the latter two entries are one. So it makes sense that to make progress here, we have to subtract from the first two components and add to the second two components, right? Now, the, the only thing here, the loss, and, and the slope, it's just, it's basically controlling the magnitude of the step. So if you think of your, stand, you know, if you're theta one, you're standing at some point, and the first question you ask is, if I'm gonna do better, do I move left or do I move right? Well, you're gonna move left if your answer is a zero, right? And you're gonna move right if the answer is a one. And so if you're gonna move left, it's gonna be negative, and if you're gonna move right, it's gonna be positive. The only question left is, how big should the step be? And that's determined by the slope, right? And the loss, the magnitude of your loss. So if you really suck, right, you want to move a lot. And you multiply by that by um, a slope that's high, you know, you're going to multiply it by a lot. But if you're really good, <clears throat> then your slope is going to get close to zero, right? And so you're going to move not so much. Right, so it's, it's, it's just, you know, basically when you're really uncertain, you take big steps. And when you get more and more certain, you make smaller steps. And, 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 the, and the negative or plus here is the direction of your step. So the last thing we need to do here is calculate the new thetas, that's these guys down here, from the old thetas. So this is now new theta 1, new theta 2 and nu theta 3. So how do we do that? Well, the basic idea is quite straightforward. We take the old theta and we multi and that, so the, the old data you know, we, uh, um, and we add it to uh, the, the, this component here. Now this is the adjustment and that adjustment is basically the product of um, our, our adjustment step uh, times that column vector that affects that affects the first um, the first column in our design matrix, right? So the uh, the first column is the let's just go up here. I want to. I don't mean to make you dizzy, but let's go back here. That's the first column here. The second column. So this is theta one, right? That's theta two, and that's theta three. So if we need to know the adjusted theta 1, we have to take in consideration all of the observations, 0, 0, 1, times those values, right? Okay, and that gives us our value here, 0.12, minus 0 0.107, and minus 0 0.171, and I put, I add these values to my old thetas, and I get my updated values here. Okay, so the point now, I think we we can almost stop because I think I just want to convince you that we've made progress. So here now, uh, theta one has gone from 0 0.39, and 
and it's moved up to 0.47, whereas theta 2 has dropped from 0.61 to 0.503, and theta 3 has moved from 0.23 to 0 0.059. Okay, so why do I think that makes progress? So let's go back up here, okay, to our, our design matrix, right? And uh, take a look here. So this corresponds to theta 1, right? Theta 2 and theta 3. And I don't know if you recognize this from the beginning, but this first guy, this first column, agrees entirely, 100%, with the response variable y. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. What that means intuitively is that this theta 1 plays a big role, right? It, it basically determines what z should be. If x1 is close to 0, uh, then z should be close to 0, should be 0. And if x1 is close to 1, z1 should be 1. So theta 1 should be chosen um, accordingly. We don't even need theta 2 or theta 3. So now if we go back here and we look at the progress that we made in these two steps, almost by magic, what you see is that theta 1, in fact, has increased, right? It's going towards 1. So it'll now we'll just recapitulate whatever x is. But these guys in these two components have dropped towards 0. So that x2 and x3, when this becomes when they become 0, it has no impact on z whatsoever. So effectively, what's going to happen if we were to continue another epoch and another epoch after that, we're going to keep we're going to keep these guys moving towards um, towards uh, one for theta one and zeros for theta two and three. Let's move a little bit forward just to show you. So here. Now, what I would do, I have to recompute Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4, no problem. I look over here and say, this is zero, that's zero, that doesn't mean anything. So now it's just theta three times one, so it's going to be just that value. Um, zero, one, one is basically then just these two guys added together. Uh, is that correct? Um, yeah, that's these two guys added together, so 0.562. And then you can stop the video and, and uh, um, validate that x3101 is 0.47 plus 0 0.059, that's this guy. And z4 is these two guys added together. So that gives me a new z vector over the four examples. Now I need to compute my z bars, which is the result of the sigmoid, right? So now I get these four points, star, triangle, circle, and infinity, like that. That'll give me, when I project onto the y-axis, that gives me their um, z bar scores. Now, of course, that means this guy is the most uncertain, right? Because uh, she's closest to the z, to the zero, to the y-axis there, right? Or whatever you want to call it, but this axis is actually the z bar axis, right? Okay, and, and infinity, which is 1.032, it's going to have the smallest slope. But uh, let's just, uh, so that's my, my z bar here uh, when, you, when you type those into the sigma function. And now I can compute my loss. So it, my loss is just 0, 0, 1, 1 minus this vector. And so now I have these scores, minus 0 0.15, 0 0.637, et cetera. And, my, uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's enough for us to stop here because what you can see is that our loss has decreased. Before it was negative 0.58, now it's negative 0.515. So we've, you know, made, we, we've actually made some ground, right? There's less loss here than there. And here it used to be minus 0.7 and now it's only minus 0.637. So we've, we've actually, you know, gotten more accurate. In the other direction, it used to be 0.371 and now it's 0.35. So it's gotten smaller, it's going towards zero. And 0.263 and 0.23, it's also gotten, um, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. 0.371 has gotten bigger than 0.35 and 0.263 has gotten bigger than 0.23. So uh, uh, it's got, it, 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 that's correct. So these guys here are trending towards zero, which they should, and these guys here are trending towards one because our original vector y is 0011 
and loss is minimized when z is equal to y, right? So it's made progress. And if we were to do more epics, we would see that it would, it would gradually converge. Our z bars would gradually converge on 0, 0, 1, 1. And so the loss would tend towards 0. And that way, that, that's the, um, the back propagation algorithm of deep learning. It's a way of finding these um, thetas to parameterize our model. And, and the only difference between this example and real industrial strength deep learners is that we have one perceptron. And in real um, deep learners, you might have tens of thousands, maybe 10,000 uh, or, or maybe 100,000 or even a million perceptrons that you have to do this procedure um, uh, over and over again every epoch. Okay. But now, now we can go back to our microscopy example using Keras and R. And recall we have our, we actually had 63 mini batches and we had this algorithm here. And I think maybe you understand a little bit better now that for each epoch, whatever, we only did two epochs there. We only had one mini batch, but we went through this procedure here where we, we first computed our Zs and then we computed our Z bars and that, that allows us to compute our loss. And once we computed our loss, we can compute our slope. Then we can compute the slope times the, um, uh, the loss and, re and update our thetas, right? And, and we do that over and over and over again. That, that's, that's deep learning. It's not really any more complicated than that. Uh, so now the original network from OAL was looks pretty complicated. And here, what, what, that, what these boxes mean, these, these um, rectangles, is that they're all perceptrons in there. And this would start it off as being an 8, 100 by 800 per, um, uh, set of perceptrons. So whatever that is, is probably a few million perceptrons in this model. And all of these guys are fed into uh, fewer nodes at each level. And that's why you get this tapering until eventually you had a soft max down here that predicted either MCF710 or MDM, uh, MDA and B231, right? Our three class predictor. Um, so in the original paper from Whale, they, they, uh, they, they managed to get an almost perfect uh, accuracy. So here in, their, in, their, in this figure, what you see is they did about a thousand epics, right? So they had their 63 batches and what you see is, uh, for example, along here is the loss. Okay, so at the beginning, they have a lot of loss and it tapers down. Now, there's four lines here. Let's take a look. This is your training and your, and your validation. So in the training, it's pretty low. But then, of course, when you, when you, then you take that, those sets of parameters, right, your model, that's your thetas, and you tried it in the validation set, that, that those examples you didn't use, in your training step, it's the loss is higher, right? That should be that way because you, you know your training you always do better, but when you go over to your validation set, um, you know it's 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 probably unrealistic realistic to think that um, your model is going to generalize perfectly, and so you're going to have a bit higher loss. But by the time you get to 400 epics, which is a considerable amount of computation, but it's not too much. Your, your loss uh, in the training and validation is converged. And um, uh, down below is your accuracy here. So what they're measuring basically is um, at one is perfect accuracy. So you see that by the time they're at 400 epics, the training and validation have converged and they have almost perfect, or they have basically perfect accuracy in the data set. In other words, every one of their images can be classified as MCF10, MCF7, or MDA231 well, without failure. So what that means, right, is that those images, those microscopy images that were fluorescent for actin filament, um, have some signal in them, inherent signal, um, that are, is very difficult to see by eye. Because remember, uh, if I scroll all the way back here, remember that when humans tried to do this problem, you know, the biologists who are, you know, the cell biologists who know everything there is to know about actin filaments, when they did it, they only had a 78% accuracy in the data. And they had a lot of difficulty distinguishing between 231 and 10. But the algorithm, the deep learner, 
finds features and weights them properly through the thetas so that it doesn't make a mistake whatsoever, which I think is a very you know nice, interesting result. Now, if you're interested and you read that paper, you'll see that they try to uh, deconstruct from that network what it's predicting on, right? Because that's the obvious next question is like, well, it works, but why does it work, right? What proof do you have that it works? And, and it must be it must be learning something in the biology, right? There must be something in that image that gives it away. But it's very hard to see by eye. But in the paper, it's very interesting to see. They try to argue that the specific features that they could pin down that are what differentiate these three different cell lines. So uh, that develop, you know, that, that the algorithm itself generates all sorts of hypotheses for cell biologists down the road to really dig into and try to figure out what's going on. And those, those features are not observable by you know, our normal uh, eye whatsoever. OK, so I'm going to switch over quickly to RStudio and show you what this looks like in, uh, in R. All right, so in uh, Project 21, uh, Deep Learning with Keras, you'll see that in the source, there's a file called cnn.r. Uh, convolution neural network. This isn't exactly the convolution neural network that was, was in the paper, but it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty close to it. And you'll also see in the data directory that there's a folder called 512. And you'll see that it, 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 um, inside of there, there's three folders. Uh, MCF10A has about the 100, what is it, 182 examples, uh, TIFF files of the different images. And, and you can look at those. Um, I think you just there. There's one uh, example of what one of the MCF10 uh, cell lines look like. So you're welcome to go and play with that. Uh, and <clears throat> so that's the input data. This is uh, in CNN.R. Um, there's a package called TensorFlow installed. You can load the library. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think our studio has GPUs. They only have CPUs. GPUs are really accelerate computation in deep learning um, settings. Uh, so you can still run the CPUs and you need the pa Keras package. And again, there's no GPU, so you just install the normal Keras. Uh, Keras. And then there's some other files here for Rasta and TIFF. It's for handling those image files. Here you can see I have a batch size. My mini batch is eight. Um, I'm computing for eight epics. We can don't worry about the data augmentation. Um, and the frac test. Well, the data augmentation, I can say a couple words. Basically, uh, data augmentation is um, that you take the figures and uh, often what you do is you sort of mess them up a little bit. You rough them up so that uh, you have a little bit of noise to them and you flip them around, rotate them. You, if you were too rigid, uh, you, the, the, sometimes these learners will um, uh, start to learn things like where the cell is in the slide, like maybe the person who made the pictures put the cell in the middle of the image. You don't want that, right? You don't want it learning to position uh, those kinds of artifacts. So you sort of like shift things around, make it a bit blurry. You make it a bit challenging, but actually it turns out to help it. Um, but we, uh, well, that's a whole different topic. Uh, here's the sigmoid function. And then I differentiated the sigmoid function for you here. Um, and then our class names, MCF, uh, the MCF10, 7, and 231. There's the, the path to the file. Now you don't even need the commented out code. This just reads in all of the images right here. And, and then um, what you see in here, if you want to look at the files, you can do a plot. Um, IMG, for example, uh, I'll show you here. Uh, oops, I haven't loaded all the files. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'd have to, maybe I can do that while I'm speaking. Let's just load some of these. Um, and I'll just come down here. I'll run that in the background. Okay, uh, so, um, I should run this too. And finally, I'll just show you an example of one of the images. Actually, right now, I reduced the resolution on these files to 512 columns and rows. The, the original files are much more, um, I think they're about twice as uh, 
higher resolution. It's because the, it's, it's because the computation is so hard. Um, uh, it, it would take a long time without GPUs to compute that. Um, when I come in here, I, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a good, um, uh, it's a good challenge for you to go through this code and understand what I'm trying to do. Um, there's the, see now you see the image that's one cell. Uh, I'm not sure from which cell line. You can see the resolution is quite high, but it's actually the real, the, like I said, the real, um, the real, um, the original files were actually twice, twice a higher resolution. I'd like you to go through this code here and try to understand how I'm switching things I, I, into a testing or splitting things into the testing and training data sets, both for X, which are, which are the images, and for the, the Y vector, which is basically the, um, uh, the answer, which is MCF7, 10, or 231. Uh, so I won't go through that code here, but I think it's pretty straightforward to do, but it takes a bit of time. Uh, and here I'm getting it into a tensor and getting it ready to be sent into uh, the deep learner um, and some extra little preparatory uh, parts. What I wanted to show you very quickly here is that I can define um, that neural net that we saw or something close to it in the lecture notes. It looks something like this where I, I define a, a model, a sequential, uh, that just means like a uh, a convolution neural network in Keras, and then I put I, I, I define all the different components of that model, and you can see each layer. I starts off with an input layer that's uh, um, of the of the image size, and it goes down to 16, and then it, it keeps getting pooled and getting smaller from 16 down to a three by three, and as you walk down here you can see that at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you get this soft max that says it's one of three different values. And, um, and then these kinds of functions in Keras uh, then apply the, the testing data to the, um, that model. That's what you see there. And the training goes on with your epics and your batch size, your training data set. For X, your training data set for Y, your validation data for X and for Y, and eventually it will stop and um, you'll uh, be able to look at the results. So I should say that you probably will have difficulty running this code on our Studio Cloud. Our Studio Cloud just doesn't have the power to compute um, this large data set, unfortunately. So uh, I put this code here as an example for you if you're interested maybe you can take a quick look at it um, as part of like a testable material but I'm not going to ask you to question uh, like to design a Keras um, neural network I just want to show you that it's not very complicated in the end it, it looks pretty straightforward I think you know you wouldn't have a problem doing it it's a bit of a challenge though uh, to um, uh, to get all the CPUs or GPUs that you need together to really compute all those parameters and that takes a few hours of computation um, but okay so I, I still think that you can take a look at the code up to um, when the model is defined right and, and just glance at how the model is defined and see if you can understand a little bit about what's in there as code I, I think you have enough R now to get the basic idea and if you run that if you run this code on the images, even at uh, half their resolution, I believe that you get something around 90% accuracy, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, uh, it probably, I've never tried to really, um, I haven't played around with it to uh, really optimize it by increasing all sorts of parameters that you could modify in these models. I'm sure you could do better than 90% and probably you could match what the, um, the authors originally did. But yeah, hopefully you understand uh, understand a little bit now about how deep learning works, right? And um, really, uh, it's overkill. I probably showed you more than you really need to know at the technical side. These days, there's so many good packages out there that you can piece together these deep learners uh, with really marginal background and uh, really, you know, it's they're powerful, and uh, you can apply them on your data from your from your research. All right.